Yeah, hello everybody, and welcome to this review and critique of Flint Hook with yours truly, Slow Wolf. Flint Hook was released on April 14th, 2017 to a positive critical reception, but as of the time of this review, it has a mixed consumer score on Steam. I want to suss out why during this review. Let's take a look. Flintook is a game I really like. A lot. And it seems I'm not completely alone, either. Critical reception of the game was generally favorable, scoring high with lots of critics. Oddly enough, months after its release, Flintook now has, at the time of this writing, a mixed reception from newer user reviews. Why? Games that inspired Flintook directly, like Rogue Legacy and Spelunky, haven't taken those same hits. Negative reviews range from the difficulty to controls and looks. Things that are lauded and valued in Rogue Legacy and Spelunky. What makes them different? Flintook is a platformer with roguelite elements that reminds me a lot of the rosy colored arcades from a long time ago, and obviously takes direct inspiration from more modern roguelite games. From minute one, the game's pixelated world screams of a time when you needed quarters to keep going, to try again. Gorgeous artwork and fun, action-packed music help to push you onwards through one ship after another. Why chase through ships though? Is it for the sake of exploration? The world of Flintook is lovely, a cute and charming place where squids, ghosts, a warlock, several Cthulhu-esque monsters, and a weird caterpillar goat beast all somehow fit. That's no small task. And what's exceptional is how none of these stick out too much against the pirate-themed spaceships and landscapes you fight in. Exploration does take a back seat, however, since the ships aren't particularly varied in terms of look and feel. What about the story? The narrative backbone exists, and it does try to create a cohesive experience. You're hunting down pirates all over the galaxy to rescue little ghosts that might or might not have something to do with the Captain Flintook, the pirate you play as. This loose, simple narrative doesn't get much deeper, but that's fine for a couple of reasons. First, the aesthetic of the game really helps to keep the story understandable through visual means. No dialogue here, just action and small but fun animations. Second, the point of the game is not a narrative one, the goal is to have a mechanically sound game. Flintook delivers on that promise well, combining tough platforming segments with satisfying combat. Along with the jumping and shooting, you have access to a few other mechanics to help navigate the spaces you find yourself in. The titular Flintook itself is easily the most used, and very satisfying to master. Hooks abound on these spaceships, and thanks to your Flintook it's an easy matter to throw yourself across a room with incredible speed. It's much harder to do so without taking damage, so practice and finesse is necessary. Once mastered, the flint hook is essential for attack, defense, maneuvering, everything, really, and it's a good thing that the main mechanic is so fun and challenging to use. You also have access to the Chrono Belt, an item that slows everything down to a crawl for a short time. At first, it was easy to ignore the Chrono Belt. You slow down as much as everything else, so why would you ever use it? This, it turns out, is a fatal mistake to make. The game constantly reminds you that the Chrono Belt is amazing, either through loading tips, or even in-game characters remarking that, I wish I had a Chrono Belt. Used properly, the Chrono Belt makes even the toughest rooms possible, since the slow time allows for the precision needed to execute remarkably cool actions. Flint hooking through a spray of bullets, flipping over your opponent, and then blasting them to space dust is fun, made possible through the combination of all of your abilities. Several other abilities can be acquired throughout the game, if you're lucky enough. Many of the ships you raid have red and white cards called perks scattered about. They aren't too rare. You can often buy them in shops or get them as rewards for completing a room. Sometimes you can get them by paying through other means, like offering up your health or getting rid of some of your blaster damage. Although not as transformative as other items in roguelites, these perks offer distinct advantages over the course of a run. Bouncing bullets, extra shields on every ship, the ability to bounce on an enemy's head Mario style, even dodge rolls. These are all options, and that's just a small portion of the perks you can get. As you play, you get the ability to equip some of these perks at the beginning of a run. This allows you to tailor your experience to the run, or to your playstyle, without completely upsetting the balance or feel of the game from the word go. Every Flintook run will be the Flintook experience, regardless of what perks you take. It's like baking a chocolate cake. You can add different icing, even add fruit on top, but the chocolate cake still has to taste like chocolate. Flintook is the same, allowing you to add extra toppings, but maintaining the same base regardless. The game's focus, however, is mechanical. 
to a fault, really, since the game doesn't really look different or feel different from the first 10 minutes to the next 10 hours. There's a gradual increase of power, as is necessary in a good roguelite, but it isn't as pronounced as it is in other games of the genre. It's subdued, even. It's as if the developers wanted a certain type of experience and wanted to keep it that way. This prescriptive type of development is okay, and I'm totally fine with it myself since I find the game fun to play on its own terms. I was happy the game would never be too easy. Unless I learned what the game had to teach me, the game would never have a moment where I would feel like, well, this run is already over. Just finish it already. That happens often in other roguelites. Even when I learned the patterns and learned to navigate the trickier corridors of Flint Hook, that feeling hasn't happened to me once. This is a plus in my books, since it means that the game will always be challenging and fun, regardless of my meta power level. The only time where it feels like the game drags on is in the final story-based raid. To be clear, this is a pretty common critique you'll find. As you're hunting down the final boss, you beat the old ones in a spaced out boss rush over the course of 12 ships. 12 is a lot of ships, and only 3 of those ships are bosses. The other 9 are regular raids, and this doesn't include a somewhat peculiar final boss for a total of 13 ships. If it wasn't for the game's ability to pause, run, and come back to it later, this mission would be nearly impossibly long. And if you want an alternate ending, be prepared to go through this ordeal at least two times, once of which will be much harder since you'll be actively taking disadvantages throughout the whole mission. The end goal of Flintook, however, isn't about the story or narrative, nor is it about the growing collection of perks and story items you accumulate. Were that the case, the game's repetitive nature would outstay its welcome quickly. No, the main aspect of the game is hunting for points. Every single mission has a leaderboard where every high score a player has earned is archived. This, I think, is what sells Flint Hook as an arcade game to me, and as a love letter to those games. Passing by old game machines and seeing the top score to beat is exactly the same as in Flint Hook. Losing is sometimes brutal, ending what might be well over 20 minutes of gameplay only to start again. But the thirst for points, for the rush of blasting, jumping, and hooking your way through pirate ships, and to getting to the top of the leaderboards, this is what drives the game forward. But is Flint took a better game for that? Certain aspects of the game suffer. The brutality of losing a lot of mission progress can absolutely break the experience for some people. This happens often enough for one reason, the environment. The environment in the game is hard to read to an untrained eye because of the subdued and unsaturated color palette. Even after playing a decent amount of time, several of the traps are difficult to parse from the foreground and background, easily taking chunks of health from the unwary player. Other times, stacking difficulty modifiers, such as the Rumble Room modifier, which adds additional pressure plate traps, and the Tenderizer modifier, which adds additional spike strips all over the place, can be put together in lethal, sometimes unavoidable combinations. Careful players can avoid the majority of the issues here. You can also often choose which ship to go to during a mission, where it shows the modifiers aboard before you select the ship. But that's not always a guarantee. It's funny though. The rooms, barring any major modifiers, are carefully handcrafted, sometimes down to the half second. I was working through a room with moving floors, spike balls, and thugs blasting down the lanes constantly. From the outset, it seemed impossible not to take damage. There is simply just too much stuff to avoid. It's at that point that something snapped into place, and I really felt like I was seeing like the code of the game, like Neo seeing the Matrix or something. A properly timed jump and judicious use of the Chrono Belt to dodge incoming projectiles was suddenly really obvious. I beat the room flawlessly, and it felt great. A degree of observation and of self-responsibility was what was needed to convince me that the game was somewhat solvable, where good skill and game knowledge was rewarded far more than good luck. Like a puzzle. Flintook is a brilliant game. The art, the actual process of playing, all of that is rewarding and worth my time. But then what about the critiques? What about the permadeath? What about the frustrating feeling of losing upwards of 20 minutes of progress? What about the repetition of the gameplay loop? At that point, you're asking whether Flint took benefits from roguelike design choices. There are three design choices that need to be present to constitute a roguelike. Meta progression, procedural generation, and permadeath. The meta progression, or account progress of the game, is fun to explore in Flint Hook and adds to it without trivializing the challenge. Collecting perks is the same, nice, but not overpowering. In these, the game experience is supported, but not overturned by the expression of roguelite aspects present. The random modifiers on every ship and permadeath 
however, are striking to some and constitute the majority of the game's difficulty. The game couldn't be built any other way, however. The last two elements are core to Flinthook and are important aspects of roguelike design philosophy. To remove them would change the game so drastically it could not be the same. There's also the core idea of the arcade game design here as well. Something rooted in the old with a splash of the new. Flinthook sports the punchy, simple, and memorable aesthetic and challenge of a simpler, quarter-fueled time and augments that feeling with modern roguelike design. It works well, and without much dissonance between the design elements. Just like Spelunky and Rogue Legacy, the difficulty of the game is not relaxed. It is forgiving of the occasional misstep, but very punishing to repeated mistakes, and death starts the entire adventure again from the beginning without so much as a note of apology. That is the nature of roguelites, the chance for a fresh new start with the thrill threat of dying like a hardcore mode character in bigger RPG games, but with less time investment. Flintook seemingly suffers from these mechanics more than most, and partially because of how it looks. One Steam user reviews by Sarkale says, quote, As much as I want to love this game, I have one big flaw to claim. Flintook does not feel, nor was it meant to be, a roguelike game. When I played Flintook, I just begged for the creators silently for more story, for a simple but successful map with accessible levels, but instead you are presented with a big pile of random levels that just feel so urged into the roguelike genre." End quote. Although there are some misconceptions here, this, I think, highlights an issue with expectation that such a charming, cutesy game would be so hard. Tumbleseed, another tough but unique roguelite in its own right, was harshly critiqued for its difficulty by critics and consumers alike. In a post-mortem blog post written by Greg Wolwyn, one of the developers, he has this to say about his game, quote, Some may call it casual. Regardless, it presents itself clearly with bright colors and a distinctive visual language in hopes its inner systems will be more easily understood. This aesthetic and philosophy is core to Tumbleseed. The simple controls that end up providing an incredible amount of nuance can be picked up by all ages and experience levels. Because of this, the game lends itself to look and feel accessible, and sometimes that's a liability. But despite all of this, I don't regret our aesthetic choices. What I do regret is not fully following through with our game's accessibility. This game, go, sorry, this goes back to the abyss that players fall into shortly after finishing the tutorial. The whole game is designed to be accessible, with the exception of that huge gap in the middle we forgot about. This disconnect between what our game appears to be and what it actually is must have contributed to the bitter taste in the mouths of so many Tumbleseed players. While an accessible game is often not so challenging, it's my belief that it's not the challenging nature of Tumbleseed that felt like the anomaly, but its functional inaccessibility." End quote. At the end of that post, Greg mentions that Tumbleseed had been patched with a less steep difficulty curve in an effort to fix the, quote, huge gap in the middle, end quote, that caused most players to put the game down. Greg uses the completion rates to illustrate this gap. 41% of Tumbleseed players completed the first level, and only 8.3% completed the next. Flintook has a similar issue, with 58% of players having beaten the first boss, but the next raid's completion being only at 23.4%. The raid after that has even less, at a completion rate of 6.2%. Although the drop-off isn't as pronounced as Tumble Seeds, it's similar. Let's compare those completion rates to another game with the same design choices, Rogue Legacy, which sports a 19.2% completion rate for the final boss of the game. It seems obvious that Flintook and Tumble Seed are peas in a pod on this one. Flintook's charm and appearance really does belie its arcade machine level of difficulty at times, and the roguelite mechanics of Flintook double down on this substantially. This disconnect is at least partially to blame for Flintook's mixed consumer reception recently, and that's a shame. Flintook is alluring and charismatic, confident without a doubt of what it is, incredibly well built despite its minor flaws. It seems fitting that the developers, Tribute, were behind the game, as it may not be the best game in the world, but it is a competent, difficult, and entertaining love letter to those games that have inspired them and so many other developers today, even if it's not for everyone. 
Maybe with a bit more thought put into evening out the difficulty, Flintook could make a better case for its own challenging gameplay to folks that just want a game about being a cute pirate ghost that wants his friends back. Thanks for listening.